Good morning and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and my third, third episode of Movement Matters. I am Christine Linders and I'm a licensed physical therapist. I've been practicing physical therapy for over 23 years in California, New York, Connecticut, and now in Hawaii in a variety of settings, including sports, orthopedics, neuro, and even on-site corporate wellness platforms. I'm a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist. I'm certified in applied functional science and I have my manual therapy certification. This is my show, Movement Matters, designed to bring you the most cutting edge and effective treatment strategies so you can help your body perform better, decrease pain, and get back to doing the things that you love. Today's topic is beach volleyball. Learn the perfect cut shot without hurting your shoulder. I am delighted to have a very special guest today, beach volleyball coach Danny Alvarez, who just finished coaching at the AVP Hawaii Open this past weekend. In today's episode, Danny and I will be discussing how to elevate your game by learning the perfect cut shot and how to decrease the risk of injury to your shoulder while you learn this tournament winning shot. We also want to teach you how a proper dynamic warm up and pregame exercise plan can improve your performance and prevent injury. But before we meet Danny, we're going to talk with Jessica, who was on four weeks ago learning what to do with her ankle sprain. Jessica, how are you doing? Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me back on to talk. I'm so Hi. glad to see you. <laughs> I am doing so much better. I'm actually able to go to work now and not wear my brace. So That's fantastic. I, uh, I know there for a while I was reporting back to you that every day after work I was achy, not really painful, but just achy. And now I can work, you know, full days, day after day and not have that achy feeling. So, oh my gosh, I'm so thankful for that. That is so good. So now I want to know the one thing because I want to get back out there with you. Have you tried or are you ready to hike Diamond Head yet? <laughs> oh my gosh. So it's somebody that you asked. So my husband had some family that came in town and they had actually just come back from Peru hiking Machu Picchu. And so they came here and they're like, let's do a hike. Oh, and wow. They wanted to hike Diamond Head. And so I did hike Diamond Head with them. Um, How'd you feel? That I, I also felt great. I didn't have, I didn't wear my brace. I didn't have any pain. I didn't have any, um, any rolling of my ankle with all oh, the wow. unlevel surfaces. So that was great. Um, I felt very much um, winded and fatigued because I okay. haven't been doing cardio and I haven't been working out since I sprained my ankle. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh my gosh, of course. That's that losing your endurance thing, right? Yes. So I totally was losing my endurance in that cardio aspect of my workout. So um, I actually stepping that back in, uh, just started that this week after we chatted about, you know, get back to it, start building that endurance back up. That's great. So I think then what our next step will be that you and I need to meet again and show you another few exercises to help get the endurance in your ankle as well as your body back. And then I think we'll have you back on the show in the next month or so. How's that sound? That sounds awesome. That would be fantastic. And then we'll set up that diamond head date too. Oh, yes. We can do diamond head again. I'll just make sure and we'll see how it compare it. That sounds good. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day, Jessica, to come back on. Thank you so much for uh, calling and checking on me. I appreciate it, Chris. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so Jessica's doing great. We'll follow up with her in another month. We'll have her back on and give her the next step for how to do her ankle sprain. And now I'm delighted to meet Danny. So Danny, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and Movement Matters. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I understand that you have been coaching and playing volleyball for more than half your life. Can you tell me about that? Well, I um, obviously uh, started, well, started in grade school, okay. not really just kind of bumping over the net. Uh, Played pretty competitively in high school and then went to college. At that point, there wasn't really a libero. I was a smaller guy. Um, how tall are you? I'm 5'9". Okay. Uh, and <laughs> people think I'm taller. You uh, look taller. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm sure. I, I project. Um, is, and so um, from that time, I, my high school coach was a great beach volleyball player. Yeah. So when I went to UH, Instead of playing for UH, I went straight to the beach, and it's kind of offered me a great uh, kind of career coaching beach volleyball to at UH, professionals, and wow. not a lot of youth in Hawaii. 
Wow, so you've made quite the impact. Yeah, it's been fun. I, I mean, I enjoy it. I like the technical aspect. Um, I'm a very competitive person, so I, I like the competition aspect. And I really like um, watching somebody progress yeah. from where they are to where they get to. I tell most people I'm not a zero to three person. There's somebody that's really good at teaching somebody how to pass. I'm usually a better getting people from five to eight or from eight to 10, ah. really perfecting something that they've learned. But I think with um, my eye and really being discerning and being able to technically do, you know, passing or hitting or setting from one level to the next level. I think that's great because uh, I play beach volleyball and I've had my ups and downs with injuries and things and time away from the sport, not because I wanted to be. And the thing that I notice when I come back is that the foundation is there, but I've lost all that technical stuff, that thing that when you're training and when you have a coach putting it in your ear about which foot needs to be forward on, which side to pass, sure. what foot you have to have forward for setting, which way you need to aim when you're running to get a ball that's maybe not in the perfect spot. Those are the things that I keep saying now that I'm back are, I forgot all those little things, those little things that made the set where I wanted it to be versus just a little bit off from where I want it, where I meant to put it. Well, it's funny. I mean, I've coached, you know, I've coached forever in all kinds of age groups, all kinds of skill levels. And I tell everybody, even like, you know, maybe some of the 11 and 12 year olds, we try to make it as fun as possible yeah. uh, for the younger kids. But, um, you know, I tell them when we bring in the UH kids or I'm bringing in the professionals, we work on skills and they want to play and which is a big part of it you know you yeah. want to play you want to be able to apply the skill yeah. in a competitive environment uh, but the competitive environment becomes more fun when you've perfected the skill so when we get the uh girls uh, in when i used to coach at uh is we used to have them for three months we used to just do skill work yeah, and that's great. when I used to coach high school, I always was nervous because there was never enough time and you kind of jumped into the season and you're like, ah, we, were, we didn't get this down. In college, I never felt like that because we had so much time to kind of get them there. By the time we got to the regular season or to nationals, which was in May, it was eight months later. I always really felt that we have as close to perfected what I wanted to be done on a bump, yes. on blocking, on footwork. And so I felt like, hey, if the other team beat us, they were better. Right. It was not because we hadn't practiced the skill enough or the strategies enough. We had enough time to do it. So I, I was always, always felt better about the college season than some of these other seasons because they're shorter yeah. and you kind of skip some steps, but you want to get them playing. So you have to kind of make a compromise there. I, I see that. I, uh, I played in college when I didn't blow out an arm here or there, wasn't having surgery. And I remember I tell Diane that the only reason why I used to be a good passer, everybody says, you're such a great passer, is because we had the skill drill of pass 100. And so we would be getting jump served, float served on the back line, and there was one garbage can sitting up at the net in the middle because at the time, you know, they wanted us to pass the middle center, could set wherever right. they wanted to set back in the day. <laughs> It's changed now, but past 100, I can't tell you how many times, two and a half hours later, we'd get to 99 for like the sixth time and someone would get stressed or panicked that it's the 99 thing. But the skill that you're talking about is in a big clutch game when you're at a high level, you can't have that nervousness or that what if end of your mind. You have to do it so many reps till yeah. it becomes you could sneeze and still pass the ball in right. that is that kind of what the skill drills you're talking about right. you perfect I mean, the skill what i tell most of the kids or most of the pros or whatever we want to get to the point i want you to think about it while we're practicing it yeah think about it and then maybe in the next week not think about it as much and then at some point i don't want you to think about it i want you to have been drilled so much that it's just natural that your arms come out in the right place your feet go the right place you have to be reminded sometimes, so yes. no matter how good you get, you know, like, hey, move your feet, you know, move yes. back, you know, get that right foot out, get the butt down, you know, something as a reminder. But you want the kids or the pros or anybody to be able to be relaxed and be able to do it. The only way is to rep it out, 
And then when you rep it out, you feel comfortable, and then you gain that confidence. Yep. That's a big thing is, you know, the confidence. If you watch Taylor Crabb oh. or Carissa Cook, who are two of my favorites, I mean, yeah. Taylor I grew up with and Carissa I coached, is they have the most volleyball confidence I've ever seen. Oh, they amazing. miss a play, it doesn't matter. They just have unbelievable confidence. And the reason is Taylor and Carissa, and they talk about those 10,000 th times. 10,000 you know, reps or yep. whatever. But Taylor was playing on the baby court at Outrigger. Carissa was playing her, with her dad in San Diego from you know, the time they were little. And so when they're out there, there's no stress at all. Oh. They just are able to do it because they've done it over and over and over. So if you start at 11 or 12, maybe not at three or four like them, you might have to do a few more, you might have to think about it a little bit more, and when you think about it, then what you're gonna be able to do is in the game time, like you said, when the pressure's on, you want your body to be able to do it without like, like uh, what do I have to do? Does my right have to be down? My butt have to be here? You just know how to do it. It makes me relaxed just hearing you talk about that because when I was, for four days watching this weekend, I kept saying, they're so calm. Taylor and Jake were down 2015 in the second game. They lost the first game. And they were not tense. They were just relaxed, no big deal. And they came back and won that match with and, game point on their head for the like final. a half an hour. And then they won the final. <laughs> they won the final. I mean, unbelievable. And, and calm I think, and confident. And Taylor. I mean, Taylor is just possibly. and then. And then Jake's 41 or 42 or something. Yeah. So he has this kind of wealth of experience. And Taylor, I mean, he's young, like in his mid-20s. But he's been playing from the time he's three or four. I, you know, I know when he was born. Uh -huh. Chris, Chris, I mean, Chris and I are good friends, his dad. Yeah. And we play a lot of volleyball. Chris is the exactly the same way. He has, he has no stress in the world. And he believes he should win every game. He should never miss a pass. He'll never miss a good shot or a cut shot like we're going to talk about. He'll, he'll hit it. He knows it in. Same with Carissa. I like watched her, and we played them uh, on Saturday morning. And she'll That's hit a cut great. shot where most people are hoping it goes in. Carissa just hits it and knows. He knows it's going in. He knows it going in because, you know, the body mechanics and the practice and just that kind of confidence of for doing it with her dad and her brother, then in college and now professionally, it's just, it's just built into her system and that's why we rep it out. That's why body mechanics are so important. That's why where your feet are to the ball are so important. Yeah. You know, as I kind of got older, uh, I realized how important my feet were. When I was younger, I never, because I always got to the ball. I never, like, didn't get to the ball. But, and I was, a, you know, I was a very good setter. Not that I'm not a great setter now, but at 50, I, you know, I'm not as good as I was, or maybe don't have as Is much confidence. Is that what you are now? <laughs> 50, I yeah. thought maybe I you had know, you beat, but. 49, 49. Good, good. Uh, but. What I noticed is my setting got worse. I'm like, how is my setting worse? My hands are still the same. I'm still <laughs> the same strength, but my feet weren't to the ball. And because my feet weren't to the ball, I wasn't set up correct. The ball wouldn't have landed on my head, my forehead because it would have been a little over here just because I don't have that kind of dexterity, the ability to move, and, and my setting got worse. And it was my feet. So a lot of what I talk to the uh, kids about or the pros about is like, why is that breaking down? It's like, because your feet. You know, you're being your lazy or you're not, you know, you're trying to conserve energy. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why a person's feet might not be there or actually too much confidence. Like they have their hands way out here. And once in a while, you still have to pass your hand you know, with your hands out here. But I'd rather you pass here. So how do you do that? You move your feet over there. And so I have to remind them of that. And then there's more um, success. Yes. And then with that like, success, then they trust you more. And then, then you can teach them more because... And they go, oh, what you know? What coach is telling me works? Yeah, and yeah. Then you get confidence in the coach. You get confidence in the coach, and that's you know, whenever like Gina came this weekend with Emily, I've coached Emily a lot, but Gina, I've you know, haven't coached in the past. So you know, you, if you teach them a few things, or you talk to them, and it works, and they go, oh, okay, even though Emily trusts you, then now I can buy into you. And that, that helps. Yeah. That's great. I want you to be my coach. And we're going to take a brief break right now. I'm Christine Linders. This is Movement Matters. I'm here with Dan Danny Alvarez. And we're learning about beach volleyball and how not to hurt your shoulder while you're learning these cut shots. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years. And we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. 
This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I'm the host of Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. We're on every Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen, most of my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at 4 o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Okay, we're back. Think Tech Hawaii. This is Movement Matters, and I'm here with special guest Danny Alvarez, who's a beach volleyball coach. So, Danny, the AVP's in town this past weekend, right? The Hawaii Open. I understand you did some coaching. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my old players, Emily Hartong, who played at the University of Hawaii and also played beach volleyball for me at UH, she texted me. I've trained her over the years. And her uh, coach right now with Gina Arango couldn't come. And oh. so I asked if I could coach them for the week. And so there we are. We, and, we coached. And so that's fantastic. And so I think we just saw a picture of you speaking with Emily and Gina in their game against Ross and Kleiman. And I remember I took a picture of the score at that time. They had lost the first set. They were down 15-10 in the second. And I wanted to know... What do you say to your team in the huddle when, you know, they're a great team. I watch them play. Those two girls, Hartong and Nirengo, are fantastic. So it's hard to imagine them almost losing to many teams. But what do you say to keep their confidence up? Or what tips do you give them? Well, it just depends on the situation. It really depends. Sometimes it's technical. Okay. Like there's a technical situation. Sometimes you need motivation. Uh, sometimes you need confidence. So okay. in that case... I'm, you know, I'm really telling them, I mean, Kleinman and Ross, I mean, Ross is an Olympian. Uh, Kleinman is 6'4", 6'5", six, six, just, you know, an unbelievable international player. Wow. Um, so, great player. So, I'm telling them to be aggressive. Um, you know, Gina was getting some serves, so was Emily, and it's a little bit different hit against a block that big, <sighs> so I'm trying to explain how Emily should be hitting the ball off of the block, not trying to angle too far down, trying to hit the ball off the hands and start to trying to ball, hit the ball into the court. And then with uh, Gina, trying to have her be more aggressive. She was chewing the ball a little bit, but it's tough with a really big block and a, a girl that can run around. April can run. Yeah, so you really you have to talk to them about being confident. And then I think at, at the point where you're showing is, I think you're always talking to them about the first contact. Absolutely. And so we're talking there about getting set up correctly, making sure that ball is hitting their arms correctly, making sure they're in the right knee flex, making That's sure right. their angles are correct. And so I'm talking a lot, but it's usually about 15, 20 seconds. Yep. Really simple, trying to get them motivated, something technical or maybe a strategic thing, like, hey, let's get the ball to that girl and let's get her high line. It might be something as small as that. But in that case, I think we're talking about passing and then being aggressive. So is there a, is there a secret to hitting the perfect cut shot? Because if so, please tell me. <laughs> well, so there's a lot to it. So it's not as simple as that. So um, Taylor hit a certain kind of cut shot. I have like four or five okay. different cut shots. So he hit the wrist away that's on the net, yep. which he can hit because he's at a higher peak and he can kind of get the ball away from his body and down. Yep. So that would be a cut shot. The ones I, well, let's back up a little bit. Yeah. The first day I get everybody, we do a little passing setting, and the first thing I teach is cut shot. Uh -oh. I, I tell people you can't play beach volleyball with a cut shot. You cannot. Uh, the reason being yep. is when they're set up in base defense, that means blocker in front and um, defender in the angle, there's a puka yeah. right there oh, in puka, front. I like that. Uh, there's a little hole there. Yep. And if they're in two-back defense, 
There's still a little hole <laughs> in the cross court um, for you to be hit the ball with touch in the front side of the court. So anyway, what I do is that's most great. most people, and again, there's a cut shot that's different for both sides too. Because a right-hander on the right side is extremely different from a right-hander on the left side. So let's go back to, because Taylor hit one from the left. You should, and your chest should be into the cross court. Okay. You shouldn't be straight on most times. That's Taylor, when you hurt your shoulder? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's, yeah, yeah. And you can, and the high-level guys can do that pretty well is where they can do that. But most people are not going to be as high as Taylor yeah. and are not as there. coordinated as Taylor. And typically the set is not as good as from an AVP player. So it's not something that I teach right away, the first. So what I tell people from the left side is get your elbow your wrist and your hand in one direction. Because okay. your chest is gonna be into that corner, your yep. shoulder is gonna be into middle back, and all you do is go from six o'clock to 12 o'clock, okay. six o'clock to 12 o'clock. So this is the basic. So there's no way you can hurt your shoulder. Absolutely, look at that this. alignment. This is it. Now That's that is very simple. Right? And, and so what we do is we do a lot of that. And another piece of that is I tell them it's a touch shot. So there's touch on that ball. So you don't want to hit it hard where he hits into the top of the net and Taylor is actually hitting it down. Did, Again, yeah. he's a different animal. He's jumping, he's doing that. But most people are not there. The kids that I'm teaching are not, not hitting it. So they have to hit the ball up and then down. And I always tell them to pick kind of one of the symbols on the net yes. for the ball to go over. The ball crosses right where we're at. Taylor can do it because then he can go get it. But most of us have to look at an AVP that's about halfway down the yeah. net or three quarters down the net for that ball to go over. Okay. So that's the first way you're going to learn how to hit a cut shot is. So is your elbow, wrist, hand, and just like this. 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock. We know it because we've seen clocks. The little kids, yeah. you have to tell them a little yeah. bit about what they know what 6 to 12 is. But yep. they're using digital, so we'll do that. <laughs> Uh, it, so I'll say 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock, but anytime you hit the ball with any touch, typically it goes up and then down. So yeah. you're trying to hit somewhere on the bottom of the ball first, so that ball goes up with a lot of rotation into the area. High line. I need to be know. taking notes right now. Yeah, this is, yeah, well, this is a proprietary stuff, so I might have to, can we cut this? Yeah, no. yeah, of course, we'll, we'll cut all this out. <laughs> so, no, after we, so, and then I'll get, them over, watch it. I'll get them over to the right side, and sometimes I'll have some left-handers, but most of them are right, and we'll get their chest to the net, yep. and this, this foot a little bit back, and so we wrap, and then we hit all the ball, and wow. then we end with our thumb up. Thumb up. The reason we don't face is because, again, if you're facing the angle, you hit the cut, it's easier, yep. but you're not going to be able to hit line. Okay. And you want to be able to hit line and cut from the same area. You don't want to That's give it right. away. Part of hitting a great shot is being a good hitter and then selling it. What I mean by selling is you have to look selling like you're hitting. Yes. You have to look like you're hitting. So if you're, fa if you're facing <laughs> that area, it's not going to work from the right side. From the left side, it's going to work because it's a more natural yeah. for a left sider to be coming in at a 45 degree angle. So we're always thinking about approach, how you hit the ball, but so the basic part of it is you're hitting all the ball. It's called a cut shot. Doesn't mean you're cutting the ball in half. You're actually getting more of the ball with oh. your hand, and then you're getting the ball to the area in front of the right side defender. It's a lethal shot. I remember back in San Diego I, over 10 years ago, uh, my friend Peter was hitting cut shots at me right from the start. We didn't warm up. This, we're gonna get to the warm up in a second. We didn't warm up, and so I tore my hamstring <laughs> on the cut shot. That's why I always call it this tournament winning shot, because you got to be ready to pull the trigger and run for yep. the thing if you're on the other side. Right. So I think what I want to talk about next, too, is what's so important. It's something that I've done for my, I guess, since I was around 19, because I started having shoulder surgeries around then, was the pregame warm up. And it just so happened that I saw all the AVP players before they went on on uh, Saturday doing a little pre-game warm-up. So here's one of the exercises I like. I usually work on my rotator cuff. I just had surgery in November, so you're going to be hitting the ball. You have to work on the muscles that not only accelerate the ball, but decelerate the ball. And so this is working on your external rotators. Now, this exercise is a great one if you want to get proprioception or shoulder stability while you're contacting the ball. Your arm's up high, and you just oscillate the band a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, because those proprioceptors 
to support the shoulder joint, I don't have a labrum, so I need those proprioceptors in my, in my tendons and everything to give my brain information. That's how I prevent hurting my shoulder while I'm learning to perfect my cut shot. But also in the, in the next image, your scapula is the area, your shoulder blade, where your rotator cuff lives. I call the scapula the quarterback of the shoulder. Your rotator cuff lives on your shoulder blade and then reaches out and attaches to the ball of your shoulder bone. And so this is a great exercise to make sure that your scapular muscles are working and keeping that shoulder blade coordinated so when you move your arm up, up, up overhead, your shoulder blade is stable on your rib cage so you don't tear your supraspinatus or tear your infraspinatus, all these rotator cuff muscles that are stabilizing the ball of your shoulder on the socket. And I think the, the last exercise is something that I like to say, undo the sport afterwards. So in volleyball, you're reaching forward to pass the ball, you're reaching forward to set the ball, you're reaching forward and you're diving, you're pushing off the sand, you're reaching up and forward to hit the ball. So guess what you need to do afterwards so that your whole front body doesn't get tight pulling your shoulder forward is undo the sport, pull your hands out, exercise it, 10 afterward. I was so busy watching the games, I didn't see anybody doing that afterward, although I'm sure they did because they're playing at such a high level. So do you, is there anything that you do for injury prevention or any tips? Those are just mine, I've been doing them forever, but any tips that you have that you can share with me or, sure. or the, the audience? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, I mean, I think those are great. Um, at UH, we have a trainer, so every day they'd be uh, on the bands for 10 minutes before we did I anything. I love it. And just all of them were just, you know, working and, you know, working. Excellent. And then obviously some of the some of the exercise. And then you want to warm the arms, whether it being throwing in the right motion. This is not a natural motion for the body. Yep. That's why we have so many shoulder injuries. That's why, you know, a softball pitcher can go day yes. after day. But uh, I think a baseball pitcher has to wait five days before they pitch again because it's overhead. Um, so for, for us, that's really important. Um, and I would get out there and what I tell most people, it, you know, you are stressing out your shoulder, but it shouldn't really be your shoulder that's doing a lot of the work. It should be timing, snap, momentum, core. Timing, snap, that's momentum, great. core. It shouldn't be, but we do. I'm not gonna say you don't use your shoulder, but if okay. you're able to kind of do it, I think you have a lot more chance to kind of save that shoulder. That's fantastic. So Danny Alvarez, thank you so much for that. Timing, rotation, re 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 reach, snap, snap and core. core. This is Movement Matters. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And remember, life is better when you listen to your physical therapist. Thank you so much, Think Tech Hawaii, for having us on. And thank you so much, Danny, for coming on. That yeah, was fun. Great. I can't wait to have you on again. Cool. Awesome.